This is a modern Yu-Gi-Oh card. Can you tell me what it does at a glance? Because I sure as hell cannot. And I've often heard that this may be due to something called complexity creep. That TCG cards get more and more difficult to understand, more wordy, less intuitive over the game's life cycle as expansions are printed out. But that was always when it was floated that idea it was always mostly vibe-based, I felt. Fortunately, my career involves punching numbers until they tell me what I want, so I figured out a couple of metrics to see if cards truly got harder to comprehend over time. I have analyzed three different card games, smashed new sets against old, and have come up with some interesting insights. In this video, I'll tell you what I found and I'll provide my theory on why those design trends happen. Let's get right into it then. Magic the Gathering. We will be comparing the following sets. Alpha, limited edition Alpha to be specific, versus Future Sight, versus Lorwyn, versus March of the Machine, which was the most contemporary set available fully on the API while I was making this video. While I chose those specific four sets, I'll tell you in a moment. Now, a good metric for determining complexity on cards is the amount of text that appears on the card, specifically effect text. I don't think flavor text has anything to do with it. It's difficult to present an effect that's more complex, more taxing mentally for the player while using fewer words in the process. Dealing 3 damage to anything is a simple effect, it's relatively a short description, but whenever you cast a non-black instant spell, deal 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker is a much more complex effect and the description of it is much longer as a result. These two metrics, complexity and the amount of text that the card effect entails, are closely connected. And indeed, here is this idea on display. As time went by and we anecdotically saw magic cards get more complicated, at least in our vision of magic, the average number of words on a card increased. Here are those specific averages for each of the four sets. Now, your keen eye will no doubt catch that there is a large increase in text card length between Alpha and Future Sight, but then it falls a bit in Lorwyn, before increasing again in March of the Machine. And that's specifically why I chose those particular sets. You see, it has something to do with the New World Order. According to an article by Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic, they caught that exact trend of cards getting more complicated than they would have liked, than they consider good for the game, and that happened as they were designing Future Sight, the most ambitious, most complex set to date, at least to that date. So, come lore when they decided to simplify some of the designs, some of the designs for common cards specifically. Floated was the idea that common cards should only influence a maximum of one other card on the battlefield, and with that came a general decrease in card complexity. This design paradigm, hence called the NWO, is in use in Magic Design Team to this very day. And indeed, it's most likely the reason why cards from Lorwyn are on average a bit shorter in terms of card description than cards from Future Sight. We see the fruits of Magic R&D's labor here. Simpler effects cause shorter word counts. For added benefit, let's see if that effect is more pronounced when we only take into account the common cards in each set. And indeed, the average common in Lorwyn is much less wordy than the average common card from Future Sight. Though we can see that this trend started to reverse sometime between Lorwyn and March of the Machine, because, because even though we are not necessarily back to future sight levels of text on commons, we are getting pretty close. Now, as mentioned before, word count can be a good indicator of complexity because the two are closely linked, but there are situations where that's not true, or even situations where the opposite might be true. 
Cards may be more complex through the use of more specialized vocabulary. If we want to get really linguistic, that's called removing syntactic redundancy, removing the redundant elements of language. So a card could instruct you to put the top card of your deck into your graveyard, or it could just as well instruct you to mill that card. In this case, a more specific, yet more complex keyword is shorter than a simpler to understand but longer phrase that means the same thing. And in that case, in the case of use of keywords, shorter card descriptions may actually be more difficult to understand, especially for a new player. So that concept may be untrue if additional words were added for the explicit purpose of including more clarity, of removing ambiguity, maybe. A big additional factor in MTG that could also have bearing on our results is the inclusion of reminder text. This is text added explicitly for the purpose of making cards easier to understand, to make it so that reading the card explains the card, as is an often cited proverb in magic circles. Most often, reminder text provides the rules for keywords that we've mentioned before that appear on the card. And indeed, when we compare the differences in average card length without reminder text, the difference between sets is much less stark. But there is a third side to this problem. The fact that more and more cards in following sets require reminder text is an indicator of an increase in complexity in of itself. If the cards were simple, they would not need reminder text, perhaps. And indeed, Future Sight, Lorwyn, and March of the Machine all include reminder text on the majority of their cards. This is partially due to wizards eschewing the practice of including keywords without reminders on cards, a practice that I don't like very much and I think it's good that they resigned from using that, but it's partially just due to wizards including more keywords on cards in general. So it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of its effect on overall complexity. It's worth noting that more reminders doesn't necessarily mean a bigger range of keywords that's being used. For example, Lorwyn only has 30 different unique reminder texts that appear on its 181 cards with reminder text, while Future Sight has 52 different ones on its 151 reminder text possessing cards. It's worth noting that even if we do take that into account, that good practice of including reminder text was assumed at least as early as Future Sight, which included reminder text on a whopping 83% of its cards. So the difference in card text length between it and part of the machine is mostly due to cards becoming more complex and not further implementation of that good practice. Knowing the mean, gives us a good idea of what the cards in the set will look like on average, but there is still the chance that perhaps one very long card or a small number of very long cards could have inflated that average. So let's also look at the median. A median is just the middle value in a set, a value that has an equal number of values that are smaller than it and larger than it. For example, in the case of March of the Machine, it would be the 146th wordiest card in the set, as there are 292 cards in total, and as it doesn't take into account the actual number of words on the card, just whether it's more or less, it would be less inflated or deflated by potential outliers. And indeed, we can see that there is a reasonable difference between the word count average and the word count median. And even if we had both the mean and the median, we still could theoretically have a set where all the cards are, for example, 50 words, and a set where all the cards are either absolutely textless or 100 words exact, and those would have very similar, well, exactly the same in this case, mean and median. So let's also look at the distributions for each set. This here is a histogram for card text length for alpha cards. The height of each bar indicates how many cards belong in that bucket. Each bucket includes cards within five words of each other, for example, cards with text between 60 and 65 words. 
This is indicated on our horizontal axis, also called the x-axis. So now let's compare the four of our histograms. We can see that for alpha there is a good deal of cards between 0 and 5 words, as well as 5 and 10, 10 and 15, and 15 and 20. Wordier cards are less numerous, with no cards being between 70 and 85, and there being single occurrences of word counts over 85 and over 95 words. Absolute card text units. This is what's called a right skewed distribution, as the so-called tail of the chart is longer to the right. That means we have outliers towards the larger end of our variable. If we compare that with future sight, we can see that there are much fewer cards with very low word counts, under 10 words or so. Medium length cards of between 15 and 30 are the most popular and there's a good representation of card texts up to say 65 words. This graph is also right skewed but less so than was the case for alpha, resulting in a similar but smaller difference between mean and median. It's worth noting that the longest text on a future side card is shorter than the longest text on an alpha card actually. When it comes to Lorwyn, we can see that a change in the other direction has taken place. While the number of cards between 0 and 5 words long is lower than ever, card number for bucket between 5 and 15 is higher than it was for Future Sight. It might be due to the New World Order shenanigans I've discussed before. There's also less popularity of cards between 50 and 65, which are quite long cards to be honest in terms of card text. This is a right skewed distribution as well, but it's approaching normal, meaning that the mean and the median barely differ, they are almost in the same place. Finally, for our final set march of the machine, there's a lot that's changed. The incredibly high mean and median are mostly a result of the population of the 40 to 45 word bucket with a large size of the 35 to 40 and 45 to 50 adding to it. There is also a second peak at 20 to 30, so if you're playing mom, you are most likely to see cards that are in the vicinity of 40 words long or 25 words long. The number of low word count cards is lower than ever, which is an especially stark difference for cards between 5 and 10 words, which were still reasonably popular in Lorwyn, but are nearly non-existent now. Interestingly, this one is left skewed, meaning that the average in this case is actually higher than the median. Very quickly, let's look at the histograms that don't take into account reminder text as it appears on cards. We can see that the card text gets shorter for most of these, as, and that's especially true for longer card texts. So our histograms become more centralized, the skews are a bit less visible, and mean and median approach each other as a result, and let's keep that in mind as we go forward. So based on card text length alone, there is a number of interesting trends on display here. The difference in text length doesn't necessarily stem from very long cards being printed, actually. Here are the wordiest cards from each set. You can see that Chandra Hope's Beacon from Mom is actually shorter than Illusionary Mask, and Bridge from Below and Colfenor's Urn are both of similar length. So our averages are not inflated per se by the printing of a few very long cards. It mostly has to do with the most popular card effects changing from short to very short, so like 5 to 25 words, to mid-length to slightly longish, 40 to 50 words maybe. This is a majority change that's more likely to influence a new player's perspective of the game. If a new player just starts playing, the glut of average cards in a pack in a match being 5 to 10 words longer than average has more bearing on their experience of play than the existence of a single super long card text on Illusionary Mask. There's also the fact that as time went by, less and less textless cards are being printed. 
That's actually the biggest change between the sets that we compared. Not necessarily that what was once 10 words is now 20, but that what was once a 3 word card is now not something that's being printed anymore. Finally, we can see that part of the card text length is the use of reminder text. It makes cards longer, that's true, so as a result it's more likely to appear on longer cards. It's a bit of a circular logic thing, that. <laughs> but even if that effect is controlled for, it doesn't explain the entirety of the change in text length. Those other factors are definitely at play here. It's likely that we can consider these changes evidence for magic cards getting more complex over time. And so far we've got these three arguments for that. The increased need for a reminder text, which suggests that there's more cards that need reminding, the increase in the number of words that appear on cards on average, and the decreased number of textless and very short card effects, which are, you know, simple by the virtue of it being difficult to include complexity when you're working with two words and a top symbol, which I'm counting as one word, by the way. What else is there? Another characteristic of magic cards that has some bearing on complexity is super types. Instant, creature, planeswalker, enchantment, etc. These are essentially keywords that often appear without reminder text. Almost always appear without reminder text, actually. They bring with them a whole swath of additional rules. To fully grasp the implication of something being a creature, a player has to understand attacking and blocking, summoning sickness, references to being a creature that appear in other mechanics like Convoke or Crew. It goes without saying that the more of these super types there are, the more information the player has to remember and process. And indeed, as time went on, we've gone from six super types in Alpha through 8 in Future Sight and Lorwyn, to 9 in Mom, with the newest inclusion of Battle. We've also had some weird ones along the way, like Dungeon. Is Dungeon a super type, actually? Check that, Editing Simon. A change from 6 to 9 doesn't seem like a lot, but there's also combinations of them, like Artifact or Enchantment Creatures which not only require a player to process the rules for both their types, but also create some additional edge cases. So the increase in complexity coming from there being 9 super types instead of 6 is not necessarily linear. So, in Magic's history, cards get longer on average, there's less textless cards, less very short cards, more need for reminder text than ever, more super types than ever. Magic is getting more complex, probably. Finally, as just a fun thing to do, I run each set through the Flash Kincaid readability test, which provides a rough estimate on what grade of the American schooling system you should be to understand a given piece of text. And completely independently of our findings, all these sets are about on a 7th grade complexity level, with Future Sight paradoxically approaching 6th grade. It According to Fleisch and Kincaid, it's the easiest. But that test wasn't really meant for analysis of such short blurbs of texts, as card descriptions are relatively short in terms of, like, stuff that gets analyzed, so it's more of a fun aside than anything substantial. Let's move on to Yu-Gi-Oh! We will be comparing two early sets, Metal Raiders and Spell Ruler, with two of the more modern sets, Wild Survivors and Cyberstorm Access. I am unaware of like a vast change in design paradigms like the New World Order in Magic in yu gi history, so I think just comparing two old sets and two new sets is a good idea. Once again, we will be using word count as a filler for complexity, and here I'll need to set up a couple of ground rules, some of them stemming from how Yu-Gi-Oh cards work, some of them stemming from the API output I got. I am counting visual indication of stuff like pendulum effect as the equivalent of a single word, like I did with the top symbol in MTG. Even though it's not a word per se, it still needs to be processed, it still needs to be parsed by the player. 
So, you know, if that wasn't the case, you could make the simplest card ever by just including, like, hieroglyphs or something. I am also counting the appearances of card names in card text as single words. I don't think a fusion monster made out of fire grass and petty dragon is simpler than one made of elemental hero flame wingman and elemental hero sparkman which, counting the words in double quotes, would indicate. It would indicate that the one that's made out of monsters with longer names is more complex, and I don't think that's true. They both parse as monster plus monster, for the most part. <laughs> Looking at the differences between our means and medians shows us two things. First, Holy shit, did cards get longer on average between the early and late Yu-Gi-Oh sets. The difference is night and day here, and over twice as large compared to Magic. Secondly, we'll have to look at the histograms to see what caused it, because there are also some differences between mean and medium, suggesting that it's worth looking for the answer as to why in how card text lengths are distributed in each set. So what immediately strikes me as interesting when comparing Metal Raiders and Spell Ruler, Yujiu has the coolest set names by the way, is that there is a whole lot of textless cards. In both cases, that basket of 0 to 5 words is the most populated one. And it includes both normal monsters, which only get flavor text in yu and no effect for the most part, or always, I guess, as well as the most of the effectless fusion monsters, which, as I've mentioned before, I've decided to parse as monster plus monster, so they are two words long, in other words. There do exist outlier cards somewhere far to the right, respectively in the 55 to 60, as well as the 70 to 75 and 80 to 85 baskets for both sets, the stark difference in length between Metal Raiders and Spell Ruler, however, has mostly to do with the population of the 25 to 40 word buckets. Let's contrast that with the new sets. Wild Survivors and Cyberstorm Access, also one of the coolest set names. What strikes me immediately is the near zero and then actually zero number of normal monsters in the set. Cards with zero words on them. Short cards under 20 to 25 have also been fully eliminated by, this, by the time Cyberstorm rolled out. Both sets have most of their cards living comfortably somewhere between 70 to 90 words, and that's very long. This has a lot to do with the inclusion of the second text area on the card, creating the oft-memed-about Yu-Gi-Oh! wall of text. These sets also have some cards that are past the 100 word mark, showing that as time went on, Konami didn't shy away from moving the top boundary further, resulting in cards that are impossible to scan at a glance. The analysis of word count on Yu-Gi-Oh! cards shows us the following. Textless cards, almost completely eliminated in the newer sets. Average card effect bloated from 15 to 30 to 70 to 80. The top end, the length of the wordiest card you can find in each set, has also increased, resulting in the differences that you can see on screen right now. In terms of additional information that you have to carry into a game and utilize whenever you see a new card, we should analyze card types as well. Most card types in Yu-Gi-Oh! carry additional terms, sets of rules, sets of rules for these additional terms, and all that stuff. Whenever you see an XYZ monster in a game, that requires you to recall what you know about XYZ monsters, but also XYZ material, XYZ summoning, the extra deck, and the rules for each of these. And these are not, and realistically could not be, explained on the cards themselves. And as a result, those are a major factor of mental bookkeeping, I guess, increasing a game's complexity by requiring new players to keep more information in their heads, memorize more rules, generally makes the game more difficult to play. And those have increased over twice, with Metal Raiders having five types only, 
Uh, I'm not counting combinations like fusion effect monster or flip effect monsters as separate types, though we do have to take into account that these exist and they may behave differently from non-fusion effect monsters or non-effect fusion monsters, and that also increased, increases the player's cognitive load at least a little bit. But for the purposes of this analysis, Metal Raiders has five types. Spell Ruler has six, with the introduction of Toon Monsters, which are also a bit of a grey area as their Toonness is explained on the card for the most part, so we could consider them a subset of Effect Monsters, I guess, but I will consider them a separate type. Then Wild Survivors and Cyberstorm Access have respectively 10 and 11. And speaking from the perspective of someone who sort of fell out of love with UGO and just redownloaded Master Duel this week, that seems a bit overwhelming. While I am aware that it's just various types of special summon, bro, carrying all that knowledge of all the possible types of monsters and summoning and effects that my opponent may carry in their deck, and possibly having to reference that as plays happen, and they happen very fast in Master Duel, oh, that overwhelms me a bit, but maybe it's just me. But I feel that that's especially true, because concepts that have to do with these, those various variants of summon, monster and spell, those end up being referenced on cards. You have cards that forbid or allow particular types of summoning, or effects that trigger on particular monsters or spells entering the battlefield. So you need that knowledge to parse what cards do. Even if you are not XYZ summoning something, there may be cards that you will need that knowledge to read. And with an increase from 5 to 11 types of cards comes an even larger increase in the number of associated lingo, the types of summon spell monster being referenced on cards. Cards in Metal Raiders mostly reference monsters in general, occasionally of a specific type like dragon monsters, but that's a tribal effect, those are pretty simple. With the occasional effect monster appearing on card as something that's referenced, in Cyberstorm Access, however, there are 19 different terms referenced on cards that include Monster, Summon or Spell. Pendulum Summon, Continuous Spell, Link Monster are all terms you have to understand to read all the cards that appear in that set. I am enjoying Master Duel though. I'm terrible at it, but I'm enjoying it. Again, upon being run through the Flash Kincaid readability test, the card descriptions appear to require a 7th grade reading skill, with Wild Survivors skirting the borders of 8th grade. The similarity to MTG in that matter would fit with the idea that UGO card complexity doesn't stem from sentence structure, but from the sheer length of text that appears on them, and from them referencing so many different game concepts. Though again, that test wasn't really made for this type of short text analysis, so let's take that with a, with a grain of salt. Finally, we will be moving on to Hearthstone, and here again we will be comparing two early sets, Classic and Goblins and Gnomes, with two newer, more modern sets, a Festival of Legends and March of the Lich King. Right out the gate, let's make it clear that Hearthstone card text is a marvel of simplicity. Our good friends Fleisch and Kincaid placed it on a 6th grade level of complexity. It has by far the shortest sentences out of the three games, and as we'll see in a moment, it has very short card descriptions in general. Due to the way some cards in Hearthstone work, I decided not to count token cards. They were included in my API output, but would falsely lower our averages as they are mostly textless or single keyword long in some cases. And as they are not a card that you can add to your deck, they are mostly an effect of another, much worthier card being played, I feel justified in my decision not to include them, they are not real cards. So immediately we see that our set of averages and medians is the lowest we've seen thus far. There is a visible difference in length between the early and late sets, but it's not as night and day as was the case for Yu-Gi-Oh! 
Looking at the histograms, we see some trends that we have already discussed in the previous two card games. Additional textless cards stop being added, the most populated bucket shifts slightly to the right, accompanied by its neighbors. Due to the somewhat low starting point, those changes are not huge numerically, but they are clearly visible. Cards drift from being 8 words long on average to about 11-ish. It's interesting that the distributions are very normal, as shown by the mean and median being close together. That means that there are no, there are no huge outliers on both sides of the spectrum, and that the population of cards below the average is similar to the ones above. Indeed, even when Hearthstone is at its worthiest, it's barely longer than the average Magic card. Which, big props to the Hearthstone design team. Some part of that is due to Hearthstone using a lot of keywords on cards, and those only show their reminder text on mouse over. Hearthstone is a digital card game only, so they can do that. And even though you can see the explanation for each and every one of these, that still makes keywords more difficult to parse at a glance, especially if it's a keyword that you are unfamiliar with, so I'd still consider it a good idea to count them up. The later sets also feature a higher percentage of cards that have at least one keyword, showing an increase of their use in card design, that trend that I mentioned before that they are hiding a bit of their complexity behind increased keyword use. This is a good idea for existing players, as keywords form mental anchors that reduce the time needed to parse a card. If I or you, if you are a Hearthstone player, see Battle Cry, you know what it means immediately. But for newer players, I consider that trend to have an element of complexity obfuscation, hiding information that needs to be analyzed by the player in the tooltips. So it will not be caught by our analysis, but it's an element of complexity nonetheless. In terms of card types, which again something that the player has to bring an understanding of into the match, it's increased slightly with the addition of location. There was also quest somewhere, though I think quest is a type of spell, right? So it's not a type in of itself. But there is the addition of location, but whether that's an increase wholly depends on whether we consider Jaraxxus from Classic a hero type card, which would be a different card type, and it's the only card of that type, so it's a bit of an exception to the rule. So, eh, not a huge increase in complexity here, maybe a slight one if you consider Jaraxxus an outlier and location to be the newest addition. So, based on what we can see, based on the metrics that we have assumed to be indicators of rising complexity, Hearthstone has maybe had a bit of complexity creep, but by no means one as large as Yu-Gi-Oh! and also not as large as Magic the Gathering. But what's most important for me here is that we see similar trends in all three of these very different card games by different studios, or companies, I guess. They may be stronger in some others, we may see more support, more visible trends in some rather than others, but we can find support for them in each dataset. Just as a quick reminder, here's what they were. Textless cards being phased out, majority of cards getting a bit longer, between 5 to 15 words maybe, super long cards don't need to be added especially, this may happen, but it's not necessary for complexity creep to occur, and the inclusion of new mechanics that require additional player knowledge to be brought into matches. And here's why I think those things happen. First of all, design space. It's easier to make more cards when you make them more complex. If in the very first set of your card game you have printed out a card that says deal 3 damage to any target, it's difficult not to step on your design toes when you want to add another card that deals damage. You can't just add a card that deals 4 damage because that's power creep, which arguably is even worse for most players because it invalidates the former design. You can't make a worse card as well because the player base is not going to like that, so you will probably make a more complicated card. Probably one that's more powerful but also more situational maybe, 
like a card that only deals 4 damage when a particular condition occurs, or maybe one that deals 2 damage now and 2 damage on your next turn, if that's a reasonable balancing factor in your game. But it's difficult to pump out new cards without making them more situational, maybe more powerful situationally as well, but all of those are very clearly connected to both card text length and complexity. And there is a very reasonable monetary reason to keep pumping out new designs, like you need people to buy stuff in order to continue with your card game, so unless that takes on like abominable proportions, I completely understand why that happens. Another factor is that as your game's life cycle goes on, more and more of your player base will be composed of existing players. Disney's Lorcana right now mostly has new players as it's a new card game, but, but as its time in the sun continues, more of those players would be considered existing players, maybe even pros, some of them. And those players will want a challenge. They will want cards that will make them use their skills to the fullest, and those cards also happen to be more complex for, more, for the most part. Uh, there is an added mental minigame, I would call it, with being able to parse complicated cards, and some part of your player base is going to enjoy that. And they are especially going to enjoy the more situationally powerful cards and generally more fitting their playstyle cards that you can design if you invite additional complexity in. So it's maybe not that all of them uh, enjoy complexity for the sake of itself, but they enjoy the designs that additional complexity is permissive of. And this is going to have a feedback effect of uh, sort of rewarding you pumping out the designs. Pumping out has a sort of negative ring to it. Of you presenting designs that have more complex effects. So your player base is going to be habituated into more complex cards and you are going to receive rewards for pumping. Why am I saying pumping out all the time? For providing them with cards that fit their expectations. That's good and understandable, but of course it may create a divide between potential new players who want to jump into the game at a later date and your established player base. And I think all of the major card games that have been uh, on the market for at least, say, longer than a year have struggled with that divide to some extent. Some have been more successful than others in tackling that divide. Is that all? Of course not. My analysis doesn't really take into account the qualitative, meaning hard to count differences in complexity that stem from what the words in card descriptions are. So draw a card, play an additional land and venture into the dungeon are all card effects of similar length but the very meanings of the words that appear on the cards change the level of knowledge that is necessary to understand them pretty substantially. Uh, that's something that maybe somebody else could analyze in the future, or perhaps I'll do a follow-up. There's also the issue of keywords and mechanic words, I guess, doing better or worse as representations of their mechanics in a semantic sense, in a meaning sense. Does haste indicate that the card doesn't get summoning sickness better than charge, for example? How about rush? Which one would be easier to remember for a new player as sort of a mnemonic technique? Would it be haste? Would it be charge? Would it be rush? If you think you've got the answers to these questions, or perhaps additional questions to add, or facets to the problem that you would like to see analyzed, make yourself heard in the comments. But for the time being, I have spent a lot of time analyzing this data, and it does seem to indicate that there is an increase in complexity over the lifespan of most card games. Some of it is because of positive design trend paradigms, like the elimination of textless cards, which for established players are a bit boring, I could consider that a positive game design paradigm. Some of it is for understandable reasons, like the monetary incentive I mentioned before, or carving out additional design space, while some of it, I have to say, is a bit puzzling and could even be considered negative in the right light.
I've been Simon from Games Deconstructed, and if you'd like, I can tell you a bit more about card game design in the playlist linked on screen right now. Thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you in the next one.